She's a member of Deloitte's uh, Board of Directors and Chair of the Foundation. She comes also with an incredible background of experiences and roles. She served as the Chair of Deloitte, uh, CEO of Deloitte Consult Consulting. And she's the founder in both the United States and India of Women in Technology. So, Janet, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Mr. Jim Clifton is a member also of the Council's Executive Committee. He's the chief executive of the Gallup Corporation. Uh, Jim is, a, is an author and scholar in his own right. His most recent book, Born to Build, is How to Build Customers and Your Best Life Imaginable. He really is the global leader in public opinion research and advanced analytics, the creator of the Gallup Path, a metric-based economic model that establishes the linkages among human nature in the workforce, customer engagement, and business outcomes. Uh, his most recent innovation, the Gallup World Poll, is designed to give the world 7 billion citizens a voice on virtually all key global issues. So I'm very honored to have all of you with us today at this pivotal time in our nation and in the world at large. Uh, of course, we know just about a year ago, we all went remote um, with the onset, really, of the global uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the hold it took in our nation and nations around the world. So this is a very important time for the Horatius special event. Um, as an archaeologist and historian, I could comment on the role for over two millennium that global pandemics have played, spread by the quest to discover new worlds, war and global trade. They clearly disrupted prevailing orders. They drove profound economic, political and societal transformations around the world and remade the world, accelerating the fall of the Roman Empire, the crumbling of the feudal system in Europe, and most importantly, the expansion of women's rights. And always during this time of great transformation, Unfortunately, driven this time by COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen profound advances in scientific and technological advancements, the birth of ep epidemiology, the discovery of insect transmission of disease, the practice of quarantine, and the development of vaccines. We have seen just in this last year, and we're participating in it today, the rapid use of telework and telecommunication, businesses that are delivering goods to homes that have expanded the industry's workforce by the millions. And very importantly, the new messenger RNA COVID vaccine, the first of its kind developed and deployed in less than a year, is truly a giant leap forward in the science, technology, production, and distribution of vaccines, leveraging the long promised convergence of biotechnology, nanotechnology, and gene editing to usher in a new era of medicine. So during this time, the Council on Competitiveness has really focused and doubled down on its mission to look at the future and shape the future and to build our work around innovation, sustainability, and resilience to new levels through the work of our National Commission on Innovation and Competitiveness Frontiers, releasing our groundbreaking report, Competing in the Next Economy, the New Age of Innovation last December, our commissioners and the leaders on our panel today really presented bold, audacious goals for the United States. We must achieve a tenfold increase in the U.S. rate of innovation, a tenfold increase in the number of innovations we develop and deploy, and a tenfold increase in the speed at which we innovate, and very importantly, a tenfold increase in the number and diversity of Americans engaged in innovation. So let me turn now to our panelists to have this discussion around competitiveness strategy as well as our global engagement. And let me start with you, Chad, in your long leadership and your role as CEO of many very important uh, global enterprises as well as, as a board member, you have made it clear that national competitiveness relies on three core pillars, innovation, sustainability, and resiliency. So if you wouldn't mind commenting over the last year and going forward, what is your take on really how we build those three pillars of competitiveness in the U.S. as well as in 
countries and partnerships around the world for the good of our global world. Uh, Deborah, thank you so much for having all of us together and thank you for your leadership. Uh, Deborah is the Council on Competitiveness and has done so much to, to make a difference in, in what our organization does. And we're very proud to follow your leadership, De Deborah. Uh, I, I look at a time of COVID-19 as an amplifier to everything. So what we've seen in organizations, it amplifies our strengths. We're able to do things we thought were not possible before. And it also amplifies our weaknesses. So as you look at those things of innovation and sustainability that we have to have, it's a great time to learn. We're learning what we could do that we didn't think was possible before. And we're also seeing the problems. What I find in organizations, we generally talk a lot about the things we could do so much better. I'm on three different boards that we all have closed the books faster than we ever have before. We thought we'd, we we wondered where we could get them closed, and they're closing them faster. Yeah, you know, I, I, I serve on, on a board of a hospital group, and we had a 55 percent increase in the number of people coming into the emergency department, and yet we were able to serve. Normally, it takes 10 minutes to serve people. We got it down to nine. we do and how we do things. And I think that's what's really exciting because I see that happening. For example, if in the big issue of climate change, we can we can take the learning we had, how do you develop a vaccine in months so it normally would take a decade? And, and can we take that same kind of technology development, just as the commission said, and do it 10 times faster? That's our challenge. I think we're up to it. Back yeah. to you. Think, would you comment a little bit on the role of um, innovation-friendly regulation and how that has both accelerated, as you mentioned, the, vac the vaccine development, but also how it relates now to meeting our net uh, carbon goals, zero carbon goals, and how this is, is really playing out in, in acceleration moving to the uh, renewable world of energy, which you play such an important role in as chairman of Royal Dutch Shell. So uh, a, a very simple thing is is uh, electric vehicles. Uh, we, we, the electric vehicles are all across our media today. I know it's Volkswagen and BMW, everybody's getting electric vehicles. If we're 100% successful at getting to electric vehicles, that will deal with 8% of the climate challenge. So, so we've got to put these in perspective. That this is only a small piece of what we're doing. So, regulation has to be much broader. It has to make sure we're taking care of all the aspects of this. So, this is a very challenging time for governments to know the right thing to do, uh, and and we, we need to really support our government by being sure we're not lobbying, but we're giving them the factual information they need so if they set up the right steps, they will really make it. Chad, do you think governments and government regulators can be ahead of the curve with the technological transformations? Or are they, do we risk in competitive strategies around the world that governments are regulating the past as opposed to understanding the future you just articulated? Oh, I think, Deborah, you raise a really good point. Uh, we've got this game we play in Shell where we bring people from the community together and you take on different roles, the government, the NGO around climate, the power producer, the power user. And you have a chance in this game over a three-hour period to play all those roles. What you conclude, at least I concluded after I played the game, the government's got the hardest job because they have to balance all these things. And then they have to take into account the new technology you just described, which is, is quite a bit different than what it has been in the past. And, and they don't necessarily have all the resources to help do that. So, so I think you raise exactly the right question, and it's up to all of us to help them. So give them the right facts, give them the support in what we're doing. Thank you, Chad. And we're going to come back you know, to talk a little bit about how the work of the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils that you chair 
is really working with all our partners around the world on the innovation friendly investment regulation that advances this, these agendas in our respective nations. Janet, talent, talent, talent. Um, I could say that, and I should say that you really, in terms of thought leadership and again, walking the walk in action, are a, a queen of the world in understanding talent throughout your career and what you're doing in, in Deloitte. So we would love to hear from you. What really are these challenges in 21st century talent, nurturing, deploying, ensuring we have an inclusive, talented world of, of all our citizens. And how does this relate to competitiveness? So thank you so much, Deborah. And uh, let me just also start by saying what a privilege it is to be with you all today. Deborah, are you having a feedback from my line? I'm not. Okay, good. Maybe it's just me then. All goodness. Um, to be reunited with you all, really a pleasure, obviously. I look forward to when we can be back in person. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about advancing competitiveness and talent. It's funny, as you were giving that gracious introduction, I think of myself as a Wall Street back office quant. Um, and to hear your introduction around talent is <laughs> um, makes me smile, but it's also a great privilege because I have spent a lot of time there's a lot to unpack in your question, um, and I know we have a lot we want to talk about. So let me begin by framing it this way. Historically, and you know better than I as a historian, competitiveness was based on physical factors such as geography, access to natural resources. And today it is clearly acknowledged that talent is key, if not the key to competitiveness, whether that is an industry, a country, an organization. And as, as Chad so well articulated, and the research certainly absolutely highlights is that the pandemic accelerated our trend towards digital and the ability to work from anywhere as we're demonstrating today. And the research would say that it's accelerated the trend towards digital by five years across most industries. It forced all, all of our organizations to look at what work uniquely requires a physical presence, but maybe more importantly, how to use technology to enable a more human centered workforce something we've been talking about for a long time, but again, as Chad said, really sort of pushed us much more aggressively forward. So I believe that focusing on developing, attracting and reskilling talent is even more critical than it's ever been. We do have to reassess a whole host of public policies in areas from education to immigration to foreign investment and really ask the question about which policy options will accelerate talent development and which will potentially impede it. If we're going to be serious about developing talent as a source of competitiveness um, within our countries as well as globally. I do think of talent development, and maybe this is why I like the topic so much, is an area that can create a positive sum game. One plus one um, is three for everyone in the broader economy. I've been spending some time um, in and around how to best articulate that because there's so much dialogue in this conversation. And I do think the curb cut effect example um, is probably the one that highlights the best. And if, for those of you that aren't familiar, the curb cut being that simply when you commit to an issue that afflicts one subset of the population, it can really have a positive externality that benefits society as a whole. We've been talking within the U.S. a lot about racial disparities vis-a-vis -vis this topic recognizing that advancing black professionals doesn't mean fewer jobs for non-black individuals. It just means the talent pool is larger, has more available, capable, qualified people. We know, we absolutely know that if we had more equity and equality, it would boost the GDP um, in our largest metro areas by nearly 25%. So a serious economic impact. I'd like, though, Deborah, if I could, to just give a couple um, of examples of where we should be capitalizing on the opportunity. And that really is around education. So our phenomenal economic success has rested in large part not on just the number of STEM graduates, but really the dynamism of our economy driven by creativity, innovativeness, and entrepreneurialism of our students and our faculty. But the global competitiveness environment, as everyone who's here with us today knows, and that's why we're all part of this conversation, is really evolving. And there have been tremendous gains globally in science and technology, and really dramatically narrowing any one country's advantage. I think there's two big challenges here. 
One is regularly reskilling large parts of the population, making that a norm and redesigning education to achieve this goal. So both things we talk a lot about in the council. So just a quick minute, if I may, on each of those reskilling. I think we've reached a critical inflection point. Individuals, firms, nations can't remain complacent about the talent required to succeed, and we must really constantly refresh our workforce. Public policy can't solve these issues alone, but it can create a better environment for talent to thrive. The shelf life of most skills is decreasing. Uh, the latest estimates I just read say that college as a competitive differentiator, so an undergraduate education, really is only of differentiating value for the first five to 10 years of a career. Beyond that, if you want to remain competitive, you really have to be focused on continuous skill development and learning. And then second is evolving models of higher education. Deborah, something I know that's near and dear to your heart, which is our higher education system needs to serve students from a broader set of backgrounds. The demography has changed so much. Students are like, more likely to be older, have attended some college already, um, be completing coursework while working full time and raising a family. This isn't just a competitiveness issue, but one that's really rooted in inequity um, that we're confronting today. I do think more equity is an enabler to competitiveness and should be seen as a crucial differentiator. So reskilling and higher education are just two threads that, that I've been thinking about and we've been collectively talking about. Other things include aligning education and career pathways, vocational education, promoting apprenticeships, and this drumbeat theme of continuous learning sits front and center for me. So a lot to talk about here, but those are some of the things that I and we and the council have been thinking about and talking about, Deborah. So Deanna, just let me build on some of your, your wonderful comments and, and perspectives here. You know, among the other areas in which Deloitte has, as, a, as an enterprise, made huge thought leadership and practical contributions is the transformation into our advanced manufacturing oh. in the United States. And we were thrilled at the council, the team, for many years with Deloitte at looking at advanced manufacturing and its integration with, en with energy. But a question here is, you mentioned vocational education and this constant skill and upskilling. Do you think in the United States that we have the partnerships we need at the local, state, and even national level to do this reskilling and, and perhaps redefine vocational education? I mean, one example, of course, is one of our great unions in the United States, pipe fitters and plumbers, and also the electrical brother. I mean, these are extremely skilled workers that have to operate with complex machine tools and software and things. Many of them are not, quote, college educated, but they come out and have important jobs, earn incomes. What can we do to change the discussion around the skills and credentials we need so people don't think manufacturing is dirty, dumb, dangerous, and disappearing? So I feel like we've laid really good foundation on this topic over the last handful of years. And, and back to Chad's acceleration point, I think we're at a pivotal moment um, as, as we come out of this pandemic to really change the conversation. I know that uh, many of our clients in the manufacturing space and our organization itself is spending meaningful time in community colleges and frankly, building, building learning and development programs um, in the communities with which we live and serve to really build a strong foundation in and around building, building and frankly, accelerating that workforce. Thank you. And I, we're going to come back to the, some of these topics, but I want to thank you and Deloitte for your tremendous leadership and commitment through your Deloitte Academy to bringing our veterans and and young military officers that are leaving the military to come to your your training and programs that you offer to really enable them to have the understanding and skills to to enter the workforce with all the talent they have. And, and that's a tremendous contribution to competitiveness. So thank you. I appreciate that. You know, I think it's just a perfect example that if each organization sort of finds their spot, right? We're, we're in professional services, helping organizations figure out how to best utilize sources of talent, including veterans and getting veterans ready for the workforce outside the military is a personal passion of mine and ours. And it's a perfect example of the kind of goodness we want to spread throughout the community. Thank you. Um, Jim. It's hard to ask you an initial question because Gallup 
more understanding and knowledge of what people all around the world think at the micro level than probably every other entity through your very innovative and long, long standing polls and questions you ask over many, many years about critical issues. So I want to kind of give you the opportunity to jump in wherever you want here, but really talk about Well, that was a good lead in. <laughs> yeah. I think you can jump in. I didn't I didn't hear the last part of the question, but maybe I don't maybe I don't need to. I would assume the group can hear me. What do you think? Deborah, can you hear me? I can hear you, Jim. I'd go ahead. Uh, Deborah, thank, De Deborah, thank you. We might be having a little bit of a difficulty as you popped off there. Maybe uh, some, uh, one of your technology people can get you back on. But thank you, Deborah. It's always a pleasure to see you. Chad, great to see you. And I'll send you that piece. I'm, uh, <laughs> Janet, nice to meet you, and I, I really enjoyed your comments. I want to, before I, uh, <clears throat> I want to make a uh, compliment something about what Janet said. All that stuff you were talking about, it, it really has to do with human development. And people don't talk about it much because human development sounds like something that, that you're supposed to, the United Nations is supposed to do or some other kind of an N NGO. Human development is more likely to happen in the workplace in our companies than anywhere else. You sleep eight hours, you live eight hours, and you work eight hours. So the question is, are they developing at work? And so we did this project. I wasn't going to talk about this, but you said this, and I get wound up. Okay, well, you've got me. I've got some comments to bring back. So when you're you done, me. I'll jump. All right, you got me wound up. But <clears throat> So we were trying to find what... What if, when a human develops, they grow, they get promoted, what's the environment? And so we did a, an analytics dive, and because we have so many employee surveys in our pool, we had 100 million, not, not questions, but actual samples. And because they're clients, we could break out the teams. So we had a million teams, and then you could, so then they're hooked to productivity. And so... Clear up at the right end, you, you, you had like the most um, productive teams in the world. Think, think of them as like Navy SEALs. They can do a project that a guy like me looks at and says, that's impossible, it can't be done, and they can do it. That, so that's what, at the other end are teams that they just screw up anything you give them. They seriously, you give them a project, not only will they not, but that's, that, was the, that was the variance. And so what we wanted to know is we wanted to find out what's the difference? Why do these people develop and win and all that kind of stuff? And our guys look. I thought it was one of the damnedest discoveries of, of my time at Gallup and Dr. Gallup and all that. But the question is, describe the variance. So if you were doing like a Six Sigma, you know, if you can find 6% or 8%, it's really great. One phenomenon explains 70% of the variance in human development on the workplace of winners, all that kind of stuff. It's just the manager. That's all it is. And when, when I first heard it, I thought seven, I, I should know that. But I thought it would be more like 25 and everything else would be, there'd be little slivers on where you went to school, what your grades, and all kinds of stuff like that. It's not. The whole thing is, if if you want to double or triple Jim's product, it's just it's just who my who my manage who my manager is. But and by the way, I told our guys put that in a the book. They put it in a book, and it went straight to. I'm complimenting them. Straight to number one on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. And it just and it just keeps selling. I, th I think people intuitively know it's right. But here's here's the point. Um, it, the the whole world's. GDP, I think it's about 85 or 90 trillion dollars, right? But the problem with it is that it's increasing at a decreasing rate. And Chad, you and I have talked about this before. But, but what it means is that economic um, dynamism per person is in decline. You guys, it's the other global warming. It doesn't work. We're trying to fix it here in the United States. Um, 
by, by putting in stimulus and, and uh, all, all that kind of thing. But if you said, what does Gallup have a silver bullet to fix it? I would have said before these guys did this, meet, I would have said we don't. Now I would say we do. I'm going to tell you what it is. Deborah, I wasn't going to say this before, but I was saying that Janet simulated me so much with this, I wanted to say this. But so there's 7 billion people in the world, 5 billion adults, and 3 billion of them say to Gallup, we wish we had a good job. That's our great global dream. We just wish we had a good job. 3 billion do. There's only 1.2 billion real jobs. ILO will tell you that there's, I don't know, 2.5. There's not. Because they count those informal jobs. People selling flowers and traffic or some kind of thing like that. <clears throat> Where you get a paycheck, 30 plus hours and night, there's 1.2 billion. When you ask them, are they engaged and developing, not satisfied, that's a, don't do that, you'll end up like Google, you don't get what you think you're getting. You gotta be working hard, setting goals, and develop. The world's population, of the 1.2, so that's the workplace, Deborah, that all of us can occur. And we want them all to do well. So you say, well, how are we doing? As we sit here, only 15% of the world's workplace, 1.2 billion people with real jobs, <clears throat> are engaged and feel like somebody encourages their development. So if you said, how do we ignite the whole world? I'd say just double it. If you could go from 15 to 30%, there'd be more economic, but it, it would fix income inequality. In a lot of ways, it would fix environment. But for the, but for the notion, Deborah, of 10 times innovation, most people will say you are crazy to even dream of that. You're not, if you want, if you could just take that 15, so we're, we're lousy at leading teams now, or, or at least at developing people, but if you go from 15 to 30, you fix it. And I, I think that that would solve it. But you say, well, how again do we do that? Just get the managers right. Everybody on this call has a, the Gallup had an office that suddenly got really lousy in London. I'm just, a group screwed up project, everything went wrong, <clears throat> start losing money. And so you think, well, all these people are no good. Do you know what we did? We just took the manager out, put a new one in that we knew was a playoff kind of person winner. He turned that thing around in two years. What's the lesson? He won big with the same players. But when the other person manages them, they look like losers. But, but there's, a silver, there's a silver bullet in world, in world leader, leadership for for, for that, so I kind of got off on a tangent, but it's it's Janet's fault because I love that topic. <laughs> well, I think if I would tie that, and then we'll get back. But Deborah, you can get us back on track here. Um, you know how I and we've been thinking about this is that it's sort of government's role to set the floor, and absolutely up to all of us to to elevate the conversation. And that's why I like the work that we're doing so much together because of that integration. Because it's, it is um, just swapping out the manager um, is intuitive, but you have to create the experience sets for our youngest leaders, our emerging workforces to understand what good leadership looks like. Some of it, it comes very naturally, but some of it absolutely can be developed and taught. And that's where I think there's a great opportunity for us to work together. You know, I, I apologize. I got somehow all of a sudden the, the screen went dead. And so I managed we to carry on without you. But now back to you. I know you would indeed. But, um, you know, I want to ask Jim a question. And then I thought we could just have a, 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 a debate among all of us. And you all jump in as you wish. But, Jim, uh, I don't know if you really talked about in the beginning this productivity gap that we have. And, you know, the, the work we did together, um, no productivity, no growth, the long term decline of U.S. productivity. Where we are right now, coming out of the pandemic, the vaccine moving forward, um, the stimulus, do you feel optimistic looking forward that we are going to see a increase in productivity? Absolutely essential if we're going to have a higher standard of living for our citizens. Well, <clears throat> Let me tell you, let me just give you a couple of ugly facts, okay, right now. <laughs> but I'm very optimistic. But, you know, some of the, the, the there's not a lot of math to right now is that the, um, the, the COVID has, has really hit the mental health of the United States. I know the United States better, better than the world. But we closely monitor, uh, it's a question that basically says, how's your life going? There's
numbers of ladders and numbers you say and all, all that kind of thing? The answer is not very darn well. Um, so I checked with CDC. They've got a couple of questions, and they track depression. And depression runs in America, um, CDC, and they do it through Census Bureau. It, it, it's really good data. I mean, the government may have some things wrong. There, there's a lot of data over there that's really, value, really valuable. It runs at about 10%. And with huge samples, excellent methodology, CDC shows um, depression, you guys, up four times. Remember, depression is not good. It's, I mean, we're talking clinical. It's not kind of like, oh, I'm depressed. I need to go to Miami and walk the beach or something. It's not that. It's something that manifests itself in withdrawal and, and anger and, and those. But then also, a lot of things go wrong with your health, and, and it's really hard to be really hard to be productive on a team. But I think that I think that leaders in America and the world are going to really have to watch that. We're going to have to bring some people back. You know, that top group of Americans, the same thing around the world, they're just killing it. Everything's going fine. Stocks are going through the roof and all that. But before the pandemic, 50% of Americans don't have enough money to go pay rent pre-COVID. When they get their paycheck, they're running over, and they're even falling. That's 50%. So if you just want a rule of thumb, 50% 50% of Americans are running on empty. 50% of the households are running, running on empty. I don't know, Deborah, what it will look like after we st- – uh, I thought that we'd be in a lot worse shape. It never occurred to me. I haven't even – It's, uh, it's uh, way above uh, my ability to think. I think uh, my, my concern is I think it's above everybody's ability, but but I don't I don't know if that's going to fix that. I, I've I've looked into and I've asked the best economists in the world what is the very origin of real economic um, generation? How do you how do you uh, energy? Let's call it. In, where does economic energy? originate. You go ask people. They're out of work that are just getting a business license and media that doesn't know what they're talking about reports them as a new business. They're not. It's a real high bar, more good information from the government. But as soon as I hire Chad, one person, so I'm the proprietor, it's now a firm. Those things have been crashing for 20 years. And so that, that's the real negative stuff. Psychology, not good. Businesses, firms, not starting. And somehow we got to turn that, somehow we got to turn that, turn that around. I think we can. You've heard me say this before, Deborah. The best place to go is to cities. But Washington cannot turn it around. They can make bad regulations. They can make a bunch of bad tax policies and all kinds of things like that. But 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 there's still enormous variance. Nashville and Austin just never stop growing. Denver's doing great. Dallas is doing great. Orlando's doing. Then you got all these other cities there. But it's local leadership. And back to the point Janet was making universities, they play a big role in these cities. I was telling the university president, actually, last night, I said, change your mission. You know, come here to learn to learn. We don't need that. We, we need you to, you, you've got to see yourself as an economic engine. Make that first. Do learn to learn later. How can you, how can, but then the same thing's uh, got to be true for, like, city council. I mean, they got to work on whatever they work on, 10 cities and all of that. But you got to say, how can you create jobs? In the business, but that's a that's a triad. But I think we've got to challenge all of the cities to say at universities and they'll say, what what can you do to help us get startups? We only need. I'm going to make a guess. I'm going to make a guess, but I think this year. You could do it with six hundred thousand, but 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 the whole solution, future of economic energy from that thing I 
and so worried about it. That's the problem. But we actually, as Americans, can pull it off and do that. I'll make one more comment. The world right now, um, for suffering, the suffering part, we built consistent staffing across 160 countries, so that gets you 98% of the world's population of choice. And right now, we put on suffering to be in the categories really bad. We show that at 15%. Just 10 years ago, it was 9 and so suffering is rising. So we got income inequality, but you also have life experience inequality, and that's growing apart. Growing apart. So it's very fixable, but I don't think we're working on the right things yet. So, Jim, thank you for that, because it brings us full circle back, really, to when the council was founded 35 years ago, and some of our really seminal work led to this whole construct. We were the first in the world, actually, with people Porter and others, to come up with the concept of regional clusters of innovation and to look at how innovation and entrepreneurship was changing our regions in the country. You know, San Diego moving from a primary naval base to because of Erwin Jacobs and his little company, Linkabit, had a contract with the Navy, and now we have Qualcomm and wireless communications and the biotech there and similar parts of the country. Now in the work of the council under the commission, one of the very important goals is to really increase more innovation capacity in more regions with more people. So I want everybody in the time we have, and, and we only have um, not quite uh, 10 minutes here, to just give a few thoughts on we're not going to see our sustainable economy and growth and inclusivity if we just have the Silicon Valleys and the, 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 the traditional centers of innovation. How can we move innovation more into the heartland of the country, more innovators, more inclusive, so that this small business growth and entrepreneurship that has made our country great really is turbocharged coming out of COVID. So, Chad, I'm going to start with you because when you were CEO of DuPont, you played a very important role in creating First Delaware. That was a fantastic initiative, leadership initiative, to start this entrepreneurial uh, activity in Delaware when DuPont at one time was the main employer. Uh, yeah, De Deborah, that's great. Uh, yeah, Delaware has found two ways to get its. Uh, Deborah, you might want to go on mute. I think we feel about that. The, the uh, two ways to get your name on the map: do this first Delaware, where we got the universities and the community college and the companies all working together and have a, a local person uh, elected as president. So it's gotten more publicity because Joe Biden was elected, but that original work of finding the real barriers of getting the funding for entrepreneurs, we found we had great funding capacity in the area. We had great entrepreneurs with ideas. They weren't connected. So we just simply connected them. So it, it's exactly what Jim was saying. You got to do it city by city. There's only so much you can do nationally. But, but uh, yeah, I think this has been a great, great conversation. Jim, I would love to hear your answer to the very clear, clear question you posed. If you found the silver bullet, we got to get the manager or the supervisor right. And that makes such a difference. Why don't we do it? What's the barrier to doing what's so obvious? Because ever since I've known you, every time I see you, you give me that same message. Every place I am, if you just get the managers right, everything else will be okay. And, and I've been trying, Jim. So, so what's the problem? How, how come we can't do it? Um, <clears throat> I think it begins. Uh, I think that we, I think we have a premise wrong, and, and I think that we think anybody can be a manager. That's one thing. It helps. Some people have a tendency, a natural ability. Uh, to, to, to run teams. And, and I think that when, if we can find people that have those tendencies and put them in the right place. The other thing is that, that but we teach them what, what they want. I don't want to pick on Google. Nobody in their right mind would. But, you know, they, they, they gave free lunch, you know, four-star sushi. And, I'm, and I really admire Google. I'm just saying that their workplace isn't what you think it is. And, and, uh, but they tried to do satisfaction. It's like t taking care of them, keep them happy and all that. But that, that's a premise, a leadership premise that doesn't work in development. When you, when you hire people, what they really want to do is, is they want to grow and develop themselves. They want to they be promoted, and they want to spend their life building something. 
people are born to build. They're, they're born to want to build. And, and But I think we've been in the wrong, I, I think we've got to get the right people, and I think that we've got to give them the, 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 the right premises. So what are you trying to do? And what you're trying to do, is, I to say with Deborah, is you and I are just going to try to get every ounce of, 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 of uh, productivity we can with her. That's okay because that's what she wants. Because that's what she wants too. I can give you a longer answer, but I'm gonna stop there. Janet, evolving. Jump in, please, on this talent and and yeah, and I think an evolving perspective on what makes good leaders and managers is really important. Um, on the attribute of real investment in your team um, and authenticity in leadership, things that certainly were not discussed when I started my career. Um, I think shining a bright spotlight on those sets of topics that though you're absolutely right, Jim, there are certainly attributes that come nat some more naturally than others. There's a lot we can learn to become stronger managers and leaders. And I think sort of emphasis and attention on those is, is underserved both um, academically, but but much more important in the workforce conversation. Thank you. We have just, um, I think, four minutes left now and we'll be shut off. So I'm going to give everybody, you know, their their last comments they want to make on turbocharging our competitiveness for inclusive prosperity and growth and anything you want to contribute that we might not have talked about. But Janet, can we start with you? And I hope you'll say something about AI. <laughs> So, you, yeah, I do love talking about top talent, but um, as you know, AI is, I think, um, under under um, appreciated in this conversation. So, appreciate you recognizing that. Um, I do believe that succeeding in AI requires um, more than just having governments and tech giants make investment. It actually ties into um, the discussion you were having about geographic um, prosperity across geographies, not just in sort of the centers. I do think as it relates to our work um, in the council, it's about national strategy around talent, R&D investment viable AI ecosystems and the ethical deployment of AI. So I'm excited to see how that conversation evolves and really important attention on the right AI priorities and goals um, for communities and countries and industries. Thank you. Real fast and then Chad, or Chad you're ready to go. I yeah. see. So uh, uh, the Global Federation of Council on Competitiveness is yeah, has developed 10 principles that we found over 25 countries have agreed to, to all improve the competitiveness of their country. I urge everybody listening to go to our website, take a look at those, because your first intuition is how could you have 10 principles you would agree to across 25 countries that were a good for all? But they really are. And I think they're, they're pretty basic and sound. And if you're looking at wanting to accelerate, once we get those great managers in that Jim said, look at these 10 principles. I think they'll be very helpful to you. Great. Thank great you. Deborah. Thank you. And we hope everyone will join the movement through the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils as well. And thank you, Chad, for your sustained leadership. Because leadership at the end of the day is the glue that holds all this together with trust. Jim, last word from you. Are we going to see future growth, prosperity? Yes, no. He's on mute. Jim, you're on mute. We got to manage our country. We got to manage our country's image for a while. We've got to remain. We've got to remain the place. That, and you got a big idea, like Elon Musk does. You got you got to come here because you never know how, how far how high your star can rise once you come to the United States. If you go back over all this stuff being built, man, so much. I'm not saying anything about the immigration that's going on today. I'm 